bow our heads. Heavenly Father, open our ears to learn the lessons of this ancient text. Speak to our hearts and help us to understand the true meaning of deliverance. Amen. 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 The scriptural background of this lesson is Isaiah 51. Isaiah 51 is included in what is known as Second Isaiah, chapters 40 through 54. Biblical scholars for centuries attributed Second Isaiah to a group of his disciples <coughs> who composed it a century or two later. However, a strong case is now made that the entire book of Isaiah was composed by the prophet Isaiah. The people of the Babylonian exile were the people of the southern kingdom, Judea. They were the tribes of Judah, the tribe of Benjamin, the tribe of Levi, the tribe of Simeon had been absorbed into the tribe of Judah. The eight tribes of the northern kingdom, who only recognized the first books of the Bible, five books of the Bible, the Torah, were the Samaritans, who were hated by the Jews of the post-exilic period. It reminds us of the antipathy between the Sunni and Shia Muslims due to an argument over Muhammad's succession. Nobody hates people like religious people. <laughs> More bloodshed. All right. <clears throat> the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar II besieged Jerusalem, <laughs> which resulted in tribute being paged by the Judean king Jehoiakim. In the fourth year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Jehoiakim refused to pay any more tribute. This led to another siege of the city in Nebuchadnezzar's seventh year, which culminated in the death of Jehoiakim and exile to Babylon of many Judeans. There were a number of other deportations over time. Isaiah announces God's surprising plan of grace and glory. They are to be delivered from exile in Babylon. Why surprising? What have they done to deserve it? They were, as we are, a rebellious people. God had promised Abraham that through his descendants, the world would be blessed, Genesis 12. God promised David that his throne would lead the world into salvation, 2 Samuel. But by the time of Isaiah, the descendants of Abraham and many of the dynasty of David no longer trusted the promises of God, aligning themselves with the promises and the fears of their false world. Many fixed, uh, many, many mixed worship of God with worship of, of early Mesopotamian gods. Judah's unbelief in God during the pivotal events of Isaiah's time redirected their future away from blessing and toward judgment. Going into exile, Judah moved from independence under God's power to subservience under pagan powers. It would be a mistake, however, to suppose that the chapters have relevance only to the captives of Babylon. After the fall of the Babylonian Empire to the Persian Empire and its founder, King Cyrus in 539 BCE. The exiled Judeans were permitted by the Persians to return to Judah. They'd been exiled in Babylon for about 70 years. You may recall that Cyrus allowed them to return to Judea with much of the treasure that Nebuchadnezzar had seized. The fate of the Ark of the Covenant was, is still in dispute. I wanna read some of Isaiah 51. Listen to me, you that pursue righteousness, you that seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn, to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who bore you. For he was but one when I called him, but I blessed him and made him many. For the Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places and will make her wilderness like Eden and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and voice of song. Listen to me, my people, and give heed to me, my nation, for the teaching will go out from me and my justice for the light to the people. I will bring near my deliverance swiftly. My salvation has gone out and my arms will rule the peoples. The coastlands will wait for me, and for my arm they hope. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, and look at the earth beneath, for the heavens will vanish like smoke. The earth will wear out like a garment, and those who live on it will die like gnats. 
that my salvation will be forever and my deliverance will never be ended. Listen to me who, you, who know righteousness, you people who have, been, who have my teaching in your hearts. Do not fear the reproach of others. Do not be dismayed when they revile you. For the moth will eat them up like a garment and the worm will eat them like wool. But my deliverance will be forever and my salvation to all generations. I really struggle with most of Isaiah. Isaiah is not for sissies. <laughs> On first blush, it appears to be quite specifically addressed to the descendants of Abraham, the Jewish people. Most of the chapters in 2nd Isaiah are taken up with praising them as God's chosen people or condemning them for their faithlessness. The author of 2nd Isaiah gives tantalizing, tantalizing uh, glimpses of a messianic kingdom promised to the descendants of David who will rule over Israel with righteous rule. So Isaiah 51 starts with, listen to me, you who know after righteousness, you that seek the Lord, look to the rock from which you were hewn and the quarry from which you were done. That's, that's Abraham and, and Sarah. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah who bore you. And I think, are you talking to me? <laughs> <laughs> or are you talking to a group of fifth century Jews who have a covenant with God dating way back to Abraham? Paul tells us in 2 Timothy that all scripture is God breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. If Isaiah 51 is only meant for them, then it has no meaning for us, unless you're a history buff. But we don't come to EMBC for a history lesson. We come to hear what God has to say to us. It's God speaking to us. Certainly, he is. We know the scripture is not just history to be fossilized in a historical literature. It is the living word of God, the servant of the Lord in the servant song of Isaiah 42, 49, and 50, and 52 is Jesus, the trusted envoy, the suffering servant. Second Isaiah has many verses that would appear to refer to Christ. Isaiah 7, 14, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and she shall call his name Emmanuel. Isaiah 53, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, and with his stripes we are healed. Isaiah 50, I gave my back to those who struck me, my cheeks to those who plucked out my beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. I have set my face like flint. Isaiah 53, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and a sheep before his shearers is silent. So did not he open his mouth. Isaiah 61, 1. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. Before the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, opening of the prison to them that are bound. This is the verse that Christ reads from the book of Isaiah while preaching in the synagogue at Nazareth, described in Luke 14. You recall Jesus closes the book, sits down and says, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. The servant of the Lord Jesus was immersed in the scriptures. He quoted it frequently and lived it. He himself said that he would not remove one jot or one tittle. Tim Keller says that Jesus did not believe in the red letter edition of the Bible. Jesus put himself under the authority of the scriptures. And assuming he expects the same from us, we need to read and understand what God is saying to us. So I think, however complicated Isaiah 51 is, is talking to us, whether you're a fifth century Judean returning from captivity or a 21st century Christian trying to negotiate this thing called life, you ask yourself, Who's in charge? Who has the answer? In the case of the Jews, the Babylonians humiliated you. They kicked you in the face. What are you going to do about it? You going to look in the back of a comic book and write Charles Atlas? Not if you're a grown-up. And how should they respond? He says, all ye who seek after righteousness. What is that? 
it's obedience to God. They know they were not right with God. Many of them had adopted Babylonian gods and had intermarried with non-believers, which is not acceptable in Jewish law. No, Israel did not float to glory at the end of Isaiah. He did not make the wilderness like Eden and the desert like the garden of the Lord. Israel's geological features have not dramatically changed. Isaiah swings back and forth between oracles of judgment, oracles of salvation. At the end of Isaiah, are they much better off? Malachi, one of the last of the Old Testament prophets, identified flaws in the returning exiles, commitment of God to God, such as insincere worship, marital infidelity, failure of the priest to preach God's word. Did Israel prosper as they approached the first century AD? No, the time of Christ's birth, they're under Roman rule. The first century Jews had fallen away, focusing on the law, and so the first century Jews, I'm talking about it, it, the Jews at the time of Christ, first century AD. The first century Jews had fallen away, focusing on the law, and so blinded they could not recognize the Son of God in their presence. What are we to learn from this? Oracles of judgment and oracles of glorious reward. Should we focus on them? I don't think so. History suggests we don't do well with that. We have a God-shaped vacuum in our hearts. God has equipped us to believe, to trust and obey. Yes, we fall short, but we, he knew we would. We believe in God. We believe in his son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who came to earth. He taught us what God valued in the Beatitudes, the parable, his parables, and how he conducted himself. He taught us how we're to treat other humans. Despite being totally innocent, he allowed himself to be crucified as an atonement for our sins. Isaiah 51, 6 says, lift up your eyes to the heavens and look at the earth beneath, for the heavens will vanish like smoke and the earth will wear out like a garment and those who live on it will die like ants. But my salvation will be forever and my deliverance will never be ended. So they never witnessed the apocalypse. Neither have we. Hollywood loves the apocalypse, but it seems a poor use of time to contemplate. Countless books are written on the interpretation of scripture about what happens at the end of life, and we want to be there when the role is called up young. But this life is our shot at living for God. I think we need to focus on the characteristics of God. One, he's everywhere. He's all powerful. He is all good. He knows everything. If we look for deliverance to some place where the streets are paved with gold and there's no enemies, we shortchange ourselves. The real deliverance is right here. The deliverance from the power of sin and death. In the Lord's Prayer, Jesus tells us, tells us we should ask God to deliver us from evil. That kind of deliverance is not transporting us from one place on the map to another. I suppose we all know people who've moved from place to place looking for somewhere they can escape the devils that torment them, only to find out that as soon as they arrive at the new place, their worst enemies just moved in as well. Yes, life is pain, but we serve a loving Savior who offers to walk with us through it. He wants us to live it to the fullest and with love. Would any of us here want otherwise? Thank you. Excellent, John.